our lesson tonight is Esther for such a time as this, and I got to thinking about it. I had decided to change the scripture reading to Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20, but I forgot to change it on the slide. So I'll read that since, since you were right. And I want to explain how it fits in with our story. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, if you think about Joseph, Joseph's brothers, his dad had died, and he came up to Joseph and they said, well, we're scared of you, Joseph. Well, what are you going to take revenge on us now? And he says, no, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good because of the saving of many lives. And when you think about Esther, Esther is for the saving of many lives also. And so the two stories fit together in God's plan. But there are some key teachings in the book of Esther that we need to know. God prepares history for his people. Same thing can be said about Joseph and getting the children of Israel out of Egypt. God had prepared all these things for it to happen so that it all fell into place. And so God prepares history for people. God uses history to accomplish his purposes. God works through history to protect his people, to keep them from harm. He guided those children of Israel out of Egypt. There was a great famine. He provided Joseph to go there to get the, the, the great barns built, to get all the grain stored, so that whenever the, the famine came, they would have food deep. So God protected his people and he used a foreign country to do it, to save his people. It's interesting how things work out. God works history to reward individuals who love and serve him. All the days of Joseph, you'd say Joseph found favor in the eyes of the jailer. Joseph found favor in the eyes of the king or Pharaoh. Joseph always was blessed. Esther, we're going to find out the same thing to be true, that God used her in a mighty way to save his people. So as the book of Esther opens up, there's this great scene. And King Ahasuerus, is how it's said in some translation, is believed to be King Xerxes of the Medo-Persian Empire. And he is just a great man. And he had a feast for 180 days. I can't even imagine having a feast for 180 days. But he did. And after that 180 days, he decided to have a feast for seven days in his own land there, in his own municipality, that region where he lived. And so this one was for just seven days. And before that banquet was over, he decided... And it mentions that they had been drinking. And he decided that he would ask Queen Vashti to come and display her beauty. Now, whatever that means, we don't know for sure, but it could have some connotations that are not really good. And so you've got all these men over here who've been partying for seven days, and they want Queen Vashti to come and display her beauty and they send a messenger to it, and she says, No, I will not come. Believe it or not, God was using that as a part of his plan, as part of his plan to accomplish his purposes. And so uh, she doesn't come, and so they go back. And the king is enraged. She won't come, and he was upset. And then they say, Well, you know what? If she won't obey you, then our wives won't obey us. And there'll be chaos throughout the country, and it will just be terrible. And so the king decided to ask them, what should I do? Well, we got this guy, and in the story, in, uh, during the Feast of Purim, they would always hiss and make all sorts of noises when you heard his name, but his name's Milmukin. And it says, then Milmukin replied, Queen Vesta has done wrong. Not only against the king, but also against all the nobles and all the people in all the provinces of King Xerxes. He elaborates and he, he, he grows her uh, abomination to being one that covers all the provinces of the whole kingdom. 
For the queen's acts of conduct will be known to all the women so that they will despise their husband and say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day, the Persian and Med Median women of nobility who have heard about the queen's conduct will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way, and there will be no end of disrespect and discord. So he's really building the case here, you know, if she gets away with this, then our wives will get away with it, and, and there's just not going to be any end to it. So he says, well, what should I do? And he wanted her to get rid of King Vashti and get another queen, to have a new queen to replace her because she wouldn't obey him and his conduct. Well, in the midst of all of this that comes about, they decide they're going to have a year of preparations to find a new bride, a new queen for the empire. And inside this story, we begin to extract the things that God would have us to hear. And there's Mordecai who raised his cousin Esther. Esther's mom and dad had died, and he had raised her since she was a little girl. And he began to hear about this deal, about they're going to select a new queen. And he encourages her in that pursuit. And she is very beautiful, and he encourages her to go. And whatever they tell her to do, he said, you do it. You take the, the beauty course that they're offering, and you do whatever they say. And so they have all this stuff that they do and all the preparation that takes the place. And she is chosen to be the new queen out of all of that. And I believe that God had a hand in doing that because God had prepared all these things to come about. And sometimes things like that fall into place to fulfill God's purpose. And so she becomes queen instead of Queen Vashti. And now she's the queen of the land. Well, Mordecai stays at the king gate so he can keep up with Esther and what's going on with Esther, and he uncovers an assassination plot. There were two guys out there, and they were planning to kill the king. And he goes and reports it, and it comes out to be true, and those men, well, they took care of those men, and they didn't kill the king. But something very important happened. This is just a huge thing. It's recorded in the Chronicles of the King. Recorded in the Chronicles of the King. It's written down. Mordecai uncovered this assassination plot, and he spared the king's life, and it's written in that book, a very important book. Well, Haman, he's the guy that suggested he get rid of his wife and get a new queen, and so Haman is promoted to be second in the land, and Haman really has a chip on his shoulders, and he thinks everybody should bow down to him. Everybody should give homage to him because he's such a powerful man in the kingdom. And whenever he goes outside, he looks and sees, and Mordecai won't bow down to him. And he says to himself, if Mordecai won't bow down to him, I'm going to get rid of him and all his people. I'm just going to get rid of them. I don't like people that don't honor me. And so when Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. And yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. So this is an annihilation even before the days of Hitler. It's an annihilation of the Jews. That's what he's planning. That's what he's hoping to accomplish. And so he's got this plan. And he goes to the king and he says, you know, there are these people who live among us who do not observe our laws. And they do not pay homage to you. Hey, and they don't honor you as king. And they do their own thing. And... I have got 11,000 talents of silver that I'll put in the treasury if you go along with me 
and make this de decree that we can get rid of these people because you shouldn't have these people living in our land. Notice, well, it's not 11,000, it's 10,000 talents of silver. 10,000 talents of silver, he's going to increase the king's treasury. He's talking the king's language there. Sounds like a bribe to me. Well, the king goes along with it. He doesn't realize exactly what all's going on with this, but he goes along with it, and, and it becomes in the law of the Medes and Persian as something that can't be changed. And so they make this decree, and Mordecai and all the people begin to rip their clothes, they tear their clothes, they put on sackcloth and ashes, and whenever Esther hears that Mordecai's out front with, with ashes on and and, and, and sackcloth, she sends him out clothes and tells him, don't do that, don't do that. And he sends back a message to her what's going on and why they're in sackcloth and ashes because they're going to be annihilated, they're going to be destroyed. So dispatches were sent by couriers all the king's provinces with the orders to destroy, kill, and annihilate the Jews, young and old, women and little children, on a single day the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. So this would cause quite a stir in, among the nation. Well, Hatash reported to Esther about the edict. In fact, Mordecai, according to the scriptures, got a copy of it and gave it to Hatash to give to Esther so she'd know what happened. And uh, she begins to think, well, what, what can I do? What, I, I'm just the queen. What can I do? So Mordecai sends back some messengers, and there's some messages that go back and forth. And here's what it says. When Esther's words are reported to Mordecai, he sent back an answer. Do not think, because you're in the king's house, uh, you alone of all the Jews will escape. Don't think because you're in the king's house you're going to be spared. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. He believed there was going to be some type of deliverance, whether it be Esther or somebody else. He says, but who knows that what you've been appointed for this very purpose. That's what it says, and who knows that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. God works through history to accomplish his purpose. God works in his wonders in mysterious ways. So she says and sends back a message to Mordecai, you go fast for three days, and me and my servants, we're going to fast for three days, and then I will go to the king. In fact, she says, I will go to the king even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So she knew the cost before she starts out. But they prayed, they fasted for three days, and then she goes to appear before the king. And when she comes in, he puts out his golden scepter, and that means she could come in without a problem. Because if you're not summoned and you come to the king, he could, he could either go down or up or whatever, but he, he, gave, that, he gave her the golden scepter. And he says, even up to half the kingdom I will give you. What is your request? And she invites him and Haman to supper. Well, Haman is the guy. I said Melmukin the other day, the other guy, but Haman's really the bad guy. Melmukin was one of the messengers there. But she invites them to dinner, and she invites them to dinner, and as they're sitting at dinner, the king says, well, up to the half kingdom, I'll give you what is your request. And she says, I want you to come back to dinner tomorrow night, and I will give you my request. And so that sounded okay to him, and he says, well, sure, I'll come back tomorrow night, and we'll, we'll discuss it. And, well, Haman just goes out, and he thinks, man, I've been so honored. I've been to the queen's house. I've eaten with her, and all these things are falling in. And I just despise this Mordecai. And his guy says, says to him, Hey, why don't you build some gallows about 25 feet tall, and why don't you have Mordecai hung on that? Well, he thought that would be a pretty good die. Even his wife was encouraging him along that lines. 
So he has them built. The gallows are built and everything is just up there ready to go and he's going to go see the king the next day. Well, guess what? That king can't sleep that night. And what that king, if he couldn't sleep. The, he said, give me a good sermon or whatever. I just can't sleep. Instead, he says, bring me the book of the Chronicles of the King. Let's read that and see if that'll put me to sleep. Well, when he read in the Chronicles of the King, it says Mordecai had uncovered a conspiracy that was to save his life, uh, the king's life. And he asked his servants, well, what have we done for Mordecai since he did that for me? Sets the stage up again. Well, the next morning he goes in there and he says, who's in the outer court? Who's in the outer court? Haman is in the outer court. Well, bring Haman in here. Let's talk to him. And he says to him, you know, what would you re recommend that the king do if they wanted to honor somebody, wanted to give him the greatest honor in the world? He said, well, I would get the king's robe. I would get the king's crown. I'd put him on the king's horse. I would parade him through the town and say, this is what shall be done to the man the king desires to honor. And he says, go at once and do it for Mordecai. Can you imagine Haman? He was probably uh, flabbergasted at that point because he was asking, he was coming in to ask to hang Haman, but that didn't uh, hang Mordecai. So here he goes. He parades him through the street on the king's horse with the king's robe, with the king's crown, and leads him through, and he has to announce this is what will be done for the man the king desires to honor. That begins to sound like an omen. His wife even said, Haman's wife said, there's something wrong here. This is an omen. Something's about to happen to you. But that night, they have to run and get Haman and bring him with him. But they come and they sit down to eat. And here's where the, the well, where the, well, where we hit the rubber. Here, here's where the rubber meets the road. Here's where she has to tell the story. And she says, you know, I, he asked her what her request is, even to half the kingdom. He says, I request my life and the life of my people who are to be destroyed, who are to be annihilated. And he, the king says, who's done this? Who, 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 who would have done such a thing? He says, Haman. This, this guy Haman's done this to us. He wants us to be destroyed. Well, the king gets up and he walks outside and he talks to some of his servants and then he goes back inside and he sees Haman, it says, crouching or laying on Esther's they, they, bed or wherever she was at. And it really enraged the king then, and then the, he brought him back outside, and the guard says, well, he's built the gallows 25 feet high for Mordecai, the man who uncovered the conspiracy plot, to hang him. And they said, go out and hang Haman on that. So they go out and hang Haman on that. Well, there's a problem. You see, in the law of the Medes and Persians, that doesn't solve everything. We've got to do something to solve the problem. And so we come about, and we come about, he makes Mordecai Haman's position. He gives Mordecai Haman's house. He gives Mordecai that position, and they have to come up with a solution because on that day, they're going to be annihilated. And so they come out with an edict, another edict, that says the Jews can defend themselves on that day. And so on that day, they, they are to do that. Here's what it says in the text. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king's province also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. So they gathered together, they realized what had happened, and they get ready for the battle. And they killed 75,000 of them, but did not lay their hands on the plunder. Among the ones that were killed were the ten sons of Haman. They wiped out Haman's family by doing that. And the king uh, was greatly pleased with what Esther and Mordecai was doing and greatly blessed them. 
And they spared the Jews because God had seen over the things that had happened there, and she was able to spare her people with the help of Mordecai and to stand up for God and to stand up for the truth and to stand up to Haman. And sometimes that's what it takes. In Esther chapter 10, in verse 3 it says, Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, prominent among the Jews and held in high esteem by his many fellow Jews because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of the Jews. What a person that was. So he did a good job raising Esther. He did a good job representing the Jewish people. He did a good job sending messages to Esther. And they worked out a solution so that they were saved. God used them to save the people. And God uses us to save other people too. And it may be that you're in a certain spot in a certain position for such a time as this. You may be in somebody's life to make a difference in their lives. There was a sign on a truck that said, Any load, any time, any distance, any place. That trucker was really in for business, I guess. But if we look at it and we compare it to our lives, we should have take on any load for the Lord. At any time, we should serve the Lord. At any distance, we should go to serve the Lord. And at any place, we should be willing to serve Him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our might, to give all we can to serve the King, our King Jesus, who is our Lord and Savior. And we serve Him in our lives by the things that we do. John Trent was playing football in high school. He wrote many books. He, he's a, a, a guy who writes a lot of books about men and being true to their family and such as that. But he, he, said, he relates one of these experiences in high school. He is playing football. And in that football game, he was called over. He had just made a good tackle. Things looked good. He didn't know why the coach was calling him out of the game, but the coach called him out of the game. He got over there, and the coach had sent in the next play, and he looked at him, and he said, I wish I had ten more guys playing as hard as you do. Now get back out there. So he was out for one play and went back in. But he said that meant so much to him. It just made his day, made his world, because he gave him some sort of encouragement that he needed, the team lost that game, but they played their hearts out because the coach believed in them. Sometimes we need to have that said to us. You are doing a good job. Keep doing it. And I wish there were 10 more just like you. All right. I told you that made him happy. In Esther chapter 4 in verse 14, the key verse that we talk about all the time, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish, and who knows but what you have been called to a royal position for such a time as this. We've been called to serve the Lord. If you don't decide to obey Christ, then you lose. If you have the courage to obey, you'll win. We have a challenge put before us. Who are we going to serve? Now, if you look at this, it says pre and post. But before we come to Christ, before we're buried in the waters of baptism, we have the world's power. The world's power, we think, is the power of Satan. But the power of Satan stops whenever we become a Christian and we're buried in the waters of baptism. And then we have God's power to carry us through, and that starts here. And God's power is greater than Satan's power, and God's power can make a difference in our lives, and we need to belong to God. Today, if you have a need, won't you come while together we stand and sing? There's a fountain free to swim.